Now, you know, most of you think that between Thanksgiving and Christmas, that's called Christmas season. But technically, you're wrong. That's technically called Advent. The Christian church, which obviously is the organization that in, you know, in, in inspires the celebration of Jesus' birth, for 2,000 years has said the period of four weeks before Christmas that leads up to it is called Advent. Christmas time is actually the 12 days after Christmas. You ever heard that song? The 12 days of Christmas? It's based on a, a literal fact. Advent is the season the four weeks before, and Christmas time is actually Christmas Day and the 12 days after it. But it's okay, you can go ahead and say Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> Advent simply means arrival or coming. It's an anticipatory statement. And this week we start a four week series, and we're gonna look at four things that God wants you to anticipate in your life because of Jesus Christ coming to earth anticipating a hope that you didn't have, anticipating a peace that you don't have, anticipating joy that God wants to put into your life, and then the fourth week, we'll look at the love that came down from Christmas, how God wants to fill your life with love. And I'm gonna be doing 92 Christmas services, or 92,000, whatever it is. <laughs> now, to start us off in this series, we've got a, uh, an old friend back at Saddleback, Ed, Dr. Ed Stetzer is the director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton University back in Chicago. He's written all kinds of dozens of books, great books. He's spoken here at Saddleback many, many times. He's a dear friend of mine and of yours. And I want you to stand up and let's give uh, Ed Stetzer a warm Saddleback welcome. Would you welcome Ed? Hey. All right, buddy. All right. God bless you. Well. Wow. Please, 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 take your seat. It's always great to get a standing ovation for showing up on time for work, I appreciate that. I hope they treat you that way where you work as well. It's good to see you. If you got a Bible, take it out, turn with me to Matthew chapter four. If you don't, turn on an app, follow along with us on screen. Lots of ways to take a look at the text we're gonna look at today. Uh, I wanna talk today, beginning our series on Advent. Now again, you've already heard Pastor Rick mention that this is actually the season of Advent. This is not Christmas. Now, technically, you're not supposed to say Merry Christmas to anyone until December 25th. But don't do that or people won't like you. So go ahead, recognize that it's Advent, but you can say Merry Christmas, right? So, and we're going to talk through the next few weeks about Advent. And so at all of our campuses, want to welcome you, those of you joining us online, as we come into the Advent season, walk working towards Christen, Christmas, we're going to talk about uh, the hope, today specifically, the hope that comes in and around these Advents and also how the kingdom of God is at work. Because at some point over the next few weeks, somebody, if you're in church life, is going to use the phrase that's in Isaiah 9-6. And it says, uh, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And we're going to hear that, and it's going to catch our attention because we've heard it before. I mean, if you've been at church at any amount of time, you've heard at some point somebody say, unto us a child is born, a son is given. That's from Isaiah. It's a prophecy speaking of the coming of the Messiah, also with application in and around Isaiah's time. But then the next part, for unto us a son is born, you know, a son is given, then it says, and the government will be on his shoulders, which is confusing to some people because we all know Isaiah is talking about Jesus. Thank God that a son was given. Jesus the Christ was born. God the Son born Jesus the Christ. But the part the government is on his shoulders is confusing because I don't know about you, but in my estimation, currently the government is not fully submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, your view may be different than mine, but if it is, we should talk because there may be deeper issues at work in your life. Perhaps you work for an agency of the government. I don't know. But most of us don't think it's perfect. Most of us think the world is still not perfect. Most of us think that everything's not yet set back right. Everything's not the way that it should be. So if Jesus has come, and with the coming of King Jesus came the kingdom of God, and the world still is not right, what's going on? on here. 
Let's look at Romans chapter 15, verses 12 through 13 on your screen. Here's what it says. It says, and again, Isaiah says, this is uh, Paul quoting from the Old Testament. He says, the root of Jesse will spring up. In and around Christmas time, we hear about the root of Jesse or the descendants of different people in the Old Testament. The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. So the root of Jesse is referring to Jesus, yet he's supposed to rule over the nations. Yet all around the world, there's still nations that are at war with one another. There's still a brokenness that's evident and real in our world. But then it says, in him, the Gentiles will hope. And that's pretty much all of us in this room. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk about that subversive hope that comes in and around Advent and why it ultimately matters. Now, we know that this involves a manger, this involves swaddling clothes, this involves a savior. We know that these things will be spoken of much in the coming weeks. But I actually want to fast forward just a few chapters from that because I believe that this hope is going to be found and tied up in two advents and one kingdom, right? Two advents and one kingdom. To see that, I'd like you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four. Hopefully, maybe you found that already. In Matthew chapter four, beginning at verse 12, it says this. It'll be on the screen as well. You can follow along. It says, when Jesus heard that John, that's John the Baptist, had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went to live in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Now, familiar language, right? Listen to what it says. Land of Zebulon, land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. It says this. The people living in darkness, we'll sing hymns that say this in the next few weeks. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, don't miss this, is near. Now we get this picture here of this darkness, this world in darkness lay, and then the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matter of fact, we're going to focus in specifically on verse 17 where it says this, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want you to read that out loud with me, would you? Let's read it together. Whatever campus you're at, if you're watching online, read it out loud with us, are you ready? From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now it's remarkable to me that Jesus' message seems to be so tied together with the kingdom of God. He talks about the kingdom of God more than 80 times in the gospels, primarily Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it wasn't just idle talk to Jesus. He spoke about the kingdom of God with present tense force. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is at hand. And then he told his disciples to seek first the kingdom of God, that seeking that kingdom would be the greatest priority of their lives. And verses 12 through 16 kind of point to the waiting period that was going to come until Jesus gave this message. And Advent is about waiting. It's about waiting for that time to come when the Messiah would come. And then the message of the Messiah comes clear. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now actually, throughout the whole Old Testament, this idea is building. Stretches all the way back to the garden, but in increasing uh, insights, we begin to see that the Messiah is going to come. And there's a growing sense of anticipation throughout the Old Testament as we go from Genesis towards the end of the Old Testament that a Messiah was going to come. He was going to be this Messiah king. He was going to set all things right. And the people wanted a Messiah who would be overt and overthrowing. He would overthrow the rule of the Romans and we'll see these things in our songs and as we read in and around our Christmas texts. They wanted a Messiah that was overt and overthrowing. And they would break off the bonds and the evil that was possessing the people from the Roman occupation. But instead, Jesus came in a way that they did not expect. They were expecting a king and a kingdom and the intensity was building until they were saying, when is this king 
and this kingdom going to come. And they were waiting for that time he'd overthrow all. There'd be no injustice. Every tear would be wiped away. They were waiting for the Messiah to set all things right. And that ultimately is what it looks like when the Messiah does set all things right. Races are reconciled. Wars come to an end. Relationships are restored. There's no sickness. There's no illness. There's no brokenness. But we're between two advents. Now that's really key for us to get. There's a first advent which is the coming of Jesus. And then there's the second advent, which is also the coming of Jesus, but it's called the second coming. So advents are just fancy words for coming, right? Matter of fact, there's a, uh, let me get the definition here, right? I got this definition this morning off of Wikipedia, so you know it's accurate. Uh, they They can't put wrong stuff there. Here's what it says. It says, advent is a season observed in many Christian churches as a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Jesus at Christmas, as well as the return of Jesus at the second coming. Two comings, right? First coming, second coming, two advents. First advent, second advent. Hope is found in two advents and one kingdom. Now it seems a little weird that advent is this time of waiting. I mean, we sort of all know what happens, right? But it's like, are we supposed to pretend for the next few weeks that we don't know that on Christmas morning, God the Son is born Jesus the Christ, right? But I mean, we do this all the time, right? I mean, there are things you know in movies, right? Spoilers, right? So I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert at the beginning of Advent. Jesus is born in just a few weeks. I just wanna get it out there, just so you know. But also too, right? Darth Vader is Luke's dad. Let's just get that out of the way. So you know that, right? So you know. Right? Only one person fits on that Titanic raft. I need you to know that right ahead because that's going to be important to you. I know I'm ruining it all for you. A Dumbledore dies. I'm sorry to let some of you know that. Okay, now why? T- well, here's the deal. Because we still watch movies a second time and we know what the ending is going to be. So you know that at the end of Advent, Jesus is born and Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas, the Christmas season actually Begins. So now I know you hate me if I've given away a movie ending to you. But in a sense, this is a reenactment, Advent is, of the greatest and most important event in all of human history. It is the event that we literally have split time around. We call everything before the birth, the first Advent, we call it BC. We call everything after the birth, AD. Why? The year of our Lord. And, and, And again, really at the second coming, It splits time again because it's the end of history and the beginning of eternity. So hope is found in two advents and one kingdom. So I want to walk through four things today from the very sentence that we read that Jesus uttered when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Four things. I want to encourage you to take out your message note sheet. You can follow along with me if you're following online. There's an opportunity to take notes there as well. All of our campuses Let's take a look at four things. Number one, I want us to look at the hope of the kingdom. Hope is our theme today. Hope is found, but in two advents and one kingdom. And I want to kind of look at the verse specifically, right? The verse that we're looking at here is Matthew chapter four, verse 17. And it says this, it says, repent. And I'm going to actually skip that word, but I want you to trust me. I'm going to come back to it. Repent. And then we're going to look at here for the kingdom of heaven. We're gonna look at those three words, kingdom of heaven. Now the words kingdom of heaven, uh, Matthew uses the word heaven because he's writing to a Jewish audience and they generally don't use the, or pronounce the word God. So he says kingdom of heaven, but he uses those terms interchangeably. But we have to begin by understanding these two advents are related to one kingdom. And that one kingdom didn't just like show up without any prior context, you see, Throughout the Old Testament, before the coming of King Jesus, there was always an understanding that God ruled over all things. Now that's key for us to understand. God ruled over all things. Matter of fact, jot this in your notes, right? God rules over all the world. Now this is true then in the Old Testament, true in the New Testament, and true 2,000 years later. God rules over all the world. We call that the sovereignty of God. And we see this throughout the Bible. Psalm 47, it's not on your screen, but it says, the Lord most high is awesome, the great king over all the earth. And it says, God reigns over the nations. In verse eight, God is seated on his holy throne. Actually, we have specifics. In Psalm 103, verse 19, it says this. 
it says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom reigns over all. So from his throne in heaven, his kingdom reigns over all. So God is sovereign over all. But you say, but Ed, how does that relate to the fact that this world is such a mess if God is sovereign over all? Well, let's, let's look at that. Because the Bible teaches of this, if the kingdom of heaven is real, God rules over all the world, leads us to not forget this reality, the world is actually broken and lost. Jot that in your notes. The world is broken and lost, right? So from his throne in heaven, God has ruled over all, but the world in which we live is broken and lost. Now, how do we know that? Well, the Bible speaks of this in many occasions, but one time it speaks about us and our former condition, but also gives us a glimpse of the condition of the world. It says this, it says, and as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now that's me and you, right? We were dead without Christ, which reminds us that a world without Christ is dead in its trespasses and sins. Those are hard words to utter, but if you're gonna sing these Christmas songs, you're gonna sing songs like this for the next few weeks. There were, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit now at work in those who are disobedient. Now don't miss this, right? Because it's key that we tie these together. Because from his throne in heaven, God has always ruled over all, but our world is in rebellion and now is broken and lost. The brokenness we feel every day, right? It impacts us, it impacts you, it impacts wars and famine and prejudice and injustice and sickness and more. It's a broken world. We know that. Nobody gets through a broken world without being in some ways broken. We all have experienced that. So the world's broken, but it's actually lost. The Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, so spiritually dead in need of being what Jesus called being born again. So that's the condition of the world, right? So from his throne in heaven, God's ruled over all. Our world is in rebellion to the rightful reign of a good, holy, and perfect God. So what about us? Are we in rebellion to God? Well, no, actually, we are given a new life and a new hope. Jot that down. We're given a new life and a new hope. Now, where does that come from? Well, okay, so we're living in the world. We're living in a world that's in rebellion to the rightful reign of a good, holy, sovereign, and perfect God, right? But here's the good news. If you're a follower of Jesus, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 applies to you. It says this, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, right? So remember, God throne in heaven rules over the world, our world in rebellion, but he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So what's happened to us is we have been transferred from a domain of darkness, broken and lost, into the kingdom of his, God's beloved son. So we have to begin to understand that there's two advents and we're living between the first one and the second one, but the hope that comes in the first advent gets us through between those times. And ultimately, the hope that we look forward to is the full completion and the full coming of King Jesus. But to understand that, we've gotta, we've gotta look at some theology, which leads us to number two. The hope of the already, but not yet. The hope of the already, but not yet. So let me explain. Now this is actually a theological phrase, already, but not yet. And the key words there in your Bible here are just the two words in the middle of Jesus' sentence for the kingdom of heaven, like is near, it is, it's come or has come, it's, it is, it's here. So the kingdom of heaven is near, it's here. The kingdom showed up when the king showed up. That's the first advent, the first uh, full understanding of the Messiah king. But there's a theological term that describes that, a theological phrase that describes that. And I like, I like for us to learn this phrase, right? The phrase is inaugurated eschatology. And I know what you're thinking. Can I say that with you, Ed Stetzer? Yes, you can. 
So let's try that. It's inaugurated eschatology. Let's try it together. Inaugurated eschatology. Let's do it again. Inaugurated eschatology. Now try to work it into a conversation with a friend this week, and then it's yours. You'll never forget inaugurated eschatology. So what does that mean? Well, you can actually recognize the first word, right? Inaugurated, the beginning of a prime minister or a president's term, he or she is inaugurated. That marks the beginning of his or her uh, rule or, or role, if it's elected position, they're inaugurated into that. So that's the beginning. And then eschatology is actually the kind of the look or the study of end things, end times, the full revealing of things. So the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. The king has come. King Jesus has come. The kingdom has come. The kingdom has begun. But still, Jesus tells us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how can it be both? Well, theologians call that inaugurated eschatology, or put more simply, it's already, the kingdom's already, but it's also not yet. And this here, not yet thing is really a key because you're gonna lose hope if you expect everything to be the way it's going to be when Jesus comes back. Because the reality is we live in a broken world and a lost world. There's injustice, there's illness, there's more. And we acknowledge that we live in an already but not yet reality, right? So one way to put it is the kingdom has, uh, ha- has actually uh, been inaugurated, but it's not yet been consummated, where it's fully realized when we pray that kingdom come, that will be done fully on earth as it is in heaven. Again, hope is found in these two advents but one kingdom. Let's, let's look at this too. You may have heard, people are talking about it all over the world, that uh, President George H.W. Bush has uh, died. And uh, President of the first President Bush in here in our country has, uh, has this old, oldest, lived longer than any other president. Um, he died this weekend. And it reminds a lot of people, a lot of the news stories around the world, you know, not just in the U.S., but uh, all around the world, are talking about his life journey, including something that happened in World War II. So maybe World War II has come back to our memory. He was actually shot down uh, in a, uh, on a mission on September 2nd, 1944. Um, and, and the people with him actually did not survive. He was celebrated as a war hero, uh, seen as a man of great character. But it does sort of remind us that uh, the World War II is maybe a picture that we can understand. Now, maybe you didn't remember uh, his, his uh, downing of his plane. I actually remember it because that's my uh, birthday decades later. September 2nd was my birthday decades later, so I remember that date. But I'm guessing there's a date that many of you know, um, and all of our campuses probably around the world, and I just, just out of interest, I want, and again, we're not gonna have you shout it out or say it, but you'll know if you know, and if you don't, there's no judgment, but how many of you know what happened on June 6th, 1944. Just raise your hand if you know what happened on June 6th, 1944. Sure, people raise their hands all over at all of our campuses. If you're at home online, you can watch your hand too. Um, That was what we call D-Day, right? The amphibious landing of 160,000 soldiers on the beaches of a place called Normandy, along with 24,000 paratroopers who kind of glided down in the midst of foggy darkness and tracer fire. It was a secret, they had to keep it a secret because if it wasn't a secret and the press leaked it or some soldier uh, leaked it or maybe the code was broken, then the Nazis, the Axis powers, Hitler, could stop this landing and keep the Allies from getting a beachhead in Europe. And if the Allies didn't get a beachhead in Europe, Hitler had a chance to keep Europe. But everybody knew that if if the Allies, that would be the, 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 the powers that fought against Nazi uh, Germany and others, if they could just get a beachhead in Europe, because the war was already turning in other fronts, that they could win the war. As a matter of fact, everybody knew that if this landing worked, the war was won. They didn't think the war was done, but they knew the war was won. Because on that day, the inauguration of the end of the war would become evident because now the battle could continue, right? And, and so it did. So they, they had a successful landing in the midst of daunting odds, in the midst of, 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 of great carnage and death and more. 
Uh, D-Day was the beginning of the end of World War II. On D-Day, the war was won. But for almost another year, the war raged on, right? So it goes on from uh, across France, and then ultimately into Germany, then the Battle of the Bulge pushes back, finally across the Rhine, and then eventually into the streets of Berlin itself. The Allies kept pushing forward until the bitter end. And finally, about a week after Hitler apparently had taken his own life in a bomb shelter, uh, finally, on May 7th, 1945, it was VE Day. That stands for Victory in Europe Day. Now, the reality is probably way fewer of you would know that day, and I don't know that I would remember that day unless I was using it as an example, but we know, many know June 6, 1944, because on that day, the war was won, but it was actually on May 7th, 1945, that the war was done. You see, on D-Day, the end of the war was inaugurated. On VE Day, the end of the war was consummated. And that's a picture for us to see that we live between these times. We live between the words Jesus uttered on the cross, it is finished, and the words I believe to be true because Jesus wins. I've read the end of the Bible. I know he wins. So, but between there, this battle wages on. Between the first and the second advent, I live And you live, but the kingdom of God has come. It's already here. I'm a citizen of that kingdom. Matter of fact, I'm an instrument of that kingdom, showing and sharing the love of Jesus in the midst of a broken and hurting world. But the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. The second coming has not yet come and not yet been consummated. So we live between the times. And I was actually thinking about how I could illustrate that for you. And a couple of ways came to mind. But then, but then I, I actually saw, I had some pictures shared with me from the Saddleback um, mission team. You know, the mission team was this week, they had a contest and they were given a gingerbread house kit. You know what a gingerbread house is. And they were told to make a manger out of a gingerbread house kit. Right? So but these are, this is our mission team. Right? This is on the leadership of David Sean, some of the sharpest minds we have at Saddleback. So let's see how they did. Let's take a look at the first one. Here it is. So this is uh, <laughs> clearly they have built, I mean, look at how they made a star out of that, right? I mean, that's pretty impressive. There's a star up there. Uh, there's, um, there's, I guess, animals. I'm not quite sure what all of those things are. Um, I think that's a manger, but I got to take off points. No Jesus. I mean, you think Jesus needs to be in the manger that's there. I mean, I don't know if that's Mary. I don't know if that's Oscar from the lower right hand corner. I'm not quite sure what all that is, but nonetheless, a good, it was a good, it was a good effort. But remember they're starting with a gingerbread kit. Let's go on to the next one, right? Here's another one. Um, I don't know what's going on here at all, right? It looks like Somebody's about to go into surgery. (laughs) And there are two aliens that are about to do surgery (laughs) on somebody. I'm thinking that's supposed to be Jesus. I'm not sure. Um, But it's, uh, but 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 it's still, I mean, look at the effort. Look at how they made an angel up there at the top. And let me tell you, the consistency of everyone having a star is amazing. Let's take a look at this one, right? these people totally cheated. Uh, there's no, I mean, there's no gingerbread. They just went and cut things out of cardboard. Um, and then there is a baby Jesus, but I think they, I don't know where they got the clothing. And I'm pretty sure the gingerbread house did not have palm trees in it. So these people have clearly cheated, right? So I don't know how, I don't judge them. Well, I do judge them, but. Um, And then this last one is the one that helped me with this illustration today, right? See those angels up there? They're doing awesome. They're having a great time. Um, Aliens again inside the manger. I don't know. Aliens wearing gas masks, it looks like. I don't really know what's going on there as well. Um, I think that's Jesus. That piece of white paper in there is Jesus. Thank you, Savior. Um, But I want you to zoom in on something that's really key for my illustration today. It assumes assumes they work at Saddleback and they put in purpose-driven life in the manger. (laughs) Because 
because on the day the Savior was born, purpose-driven life was actually there, <laughs> right? But these people know, they know where they work, right? So, so, so what does that mean? Now, Purpose Driven Life, for those of you who don't know, is a, a book. Um, I've not read it, uh, but, <laughs> but I, I heard and sold a few copies, um, millions of them, and uh, it was written by Rick Warren. I think I wrote an endorsement or something. You're welcome. Uh, that probably, <laughs> probably turned it around for him. And um, so... So, but I want you to see that, that um, the understanding of the first and second advent is in many ways seeing a story in two volumes, right? So, so, so think in terms of, of a book and right, and you take it and think of it volume one and then volume two, because what happens is you have to sort of understand that the, the second volume contains even more or the rest of the story. So we, we live between, we have a first volume and a second volume. Now, Rick actually hasn't written the second volume to Purpose Driven Life, but a lot of people are calling a brand new book out kind of the perfect sequel. It's actually the one I just wrote. It's called Christians in the Age of Outrage, right? So, which I did actually, believe it or not, I dedicated it to Rick Warren. Fun fact, true story. Taught me a lot about cultural engagement, right? It's about how to engage culture in the midst of kind of outrage time, Christians in the Age of Outrage. So, so let's see it as kind of a, and again, people are saying it may sell more than Purpose Driven Life, to be fair. That was my mom and, uh, and my wife. They're both thinking it's even better. But I want you to think in terms of a two volume story. Now, by the way, this is gonna help you understand why sometimes the Old Testament prophets, which like Isaiah, so think kind of here historically, we're in the Old Testament time before Christ. They would sort of speak to and they would say something like, unto us a child is born, a son is given. Which, by the way, general, often had a prophetic significance in their day, but then looked forward to the day when the Messiah would come. Jesus the Christ, right? God the Son born Jesus the Christ. So, so they would prophetically speak of that, but they would speak of it as one event. But looking back from our side of history, we actually know that there's two parts to the coming of the Messiah. Right, so there's a first advent, and then there's a second advent. And we live literally between the times. So when they say from here, for unto us a, a child is born, a son will be given, and the government will be on his shoulders, that's what it looks like from here. From where we are between the times, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and one day the government will be on his shoulders. One day, all this brokenness, all this sickness, all this division, all this mess of brokenness and lostness will be fixed by King Jesus, but he's still come, and I'm a citizen of his kingdom today. So we live between the times. In our age, it's an age of outrage, but people have lived in different times on that journey. We live between these times. There's a famous sermon that was made, uh, perhaps best known in the African-American context that later was introduced more broadly. And the preacher would speak about some of the brokenness and the oppression and the injustice experienced in the African-American context and might say, you know, we're, 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 we've been, we're being repressed. We've been, we, 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 we've actually seen injustice. We've seen, we've seen our rights held back. We've seen our people marginalized and pushed. But then preaching the gospel, the, the preacher would say, listen, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. See, because, and then the sermon would sort of grow in the intensity because in Friday, it's Friday and the kingdom has come. Jesus has said, it is finished. Jesus has won the victory, but Sunday's coming and the cadence of the sermon would grow. And the preacher would say, it's Friday and speak about the sickness and the anger and the frustration that's being in the midst of this mess. It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. And with each time, people would know they live between, and we do, right? These two are bookends on the kingdom calendar. We live between the Good Friday of kingdom conquest and the Easter Sunday of kingdom coronation. And we live between these times. And guess what? It's Saturday, Philip Yancey writes. It's Saturday on planet Earth. And Saturday is a work day. 
See, there comes a day when we're not gonna wear a ribbon to speak about and remember World AIDS Day. There comes a day when you're not gonna have prayer requests that have burdened your heart so deeply that sometimes it brings you to grieve because it's still Friday, but Sundays are coming. The kingdom has been inaugurated, but it's not yet been consummated. But our hope is found in those two advents and that one kingdom. So let's talk about number three in our outline is the hope we bear. The hope we bear. Again, hope is found in two advents in one kingdom. And as you look in the text again, it says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. One word, near. The shortest point probably ever in a message. Just the word near. See, the king came, the kingdom has come, the kingdom of heaven is near, and we are citizens of that kingdom and bearers of that kingdom message. In Matthew 10, 7, Jesus says it again, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matter of fact, the Pharisees once asked Jesus, where's the kingdom coming? What's it gonna look like? And he says to them, the coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. You are a citizen of the kingdom. Maybe you've used that language. Been around church long enough, people start talking about kingdom values and being a kingdom citizen, but... Do you know that being a kingdom citizen means you're in rebellion to the values of the world that's in rebellion to the true values of the kingdom? And we find this sometimes, that our values bump up against the values of the world. Because remember, God from his throne in heaven rules over all, but our world's in rebellion to the rightful reign of a good, holy, sovereign, and perfect God. Yet, he has transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. So now, the hope we bear means that we're actually sometimes working contrary to the rebellion of the world against the rightful reign of God. When I moved to uh, Tennessee, I didn't know I'd lived there for almost a decade. My daughters, I have, uh, I have three daughters. Uh, they are amazing, and that's also a prayer request. So God, give me the grace and strength. Uh, my 14-year-old daughter's uh, with me this weekend as we've come down from Chicago. She, she, uh, she loves, wants to come to school here in Southern California. She loves it here. And uh, so, but my, when we move, we live in Chicagoland now where I serve at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, but they lived in Nashville for nine years. They think of themselves as Tennesseans. My oldest daughter was studying Tennessee history and she, she asked me if I could um, take a, sit down and help her study. And I don't know anything about Tennessee history. I grew up in New York, so I know about New York state history. And every state has some class requirement that you'd learn the state's history. But so she said, well, help me. And so I began to learn a little bit of Tennessee history at the same time. And it was good. It was good for me to know a little bit of this. But one of the things that was fascinating to me was Tennessee's role in the Civil War. Uh, in the U.S., there was, a, uh, there was a war called a civil war between the North and the South. The South seceded from the country in what the Supreme Court later said was an illegal and illegitimate rebellion. President Lincoln was the president at that time. He used similar words as illegal and illegitimate. Uh, the states seceded. The, 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 the battle was about slavery, other things as well. And the states um, seceded, a bunch of them at first, but Tennessee was not among them. As a matter of fact... Tennessee was the last state to secede from the Union and join this alternative, though illegally created country called the Confederate States of America. So Tennessee eventually votes to join this, but they, at first they don't because the state's divided. The western side of the state is more like maybe Mississippi. It's farming and agriculture dependent upon slavery. The middle part of the state, kind of a mix of that. The eastern part of the state, more mountainous, uh, not, not at all connected to the historic thing that would be called the American South as in the same way. Matter of fact, they, they actually had, uh, they have, there's, a, there's a county in East Tennessee called, uh, called Union County. The Union was the North, the rebels, the rebellion was the South. And so, but here's what happened. So at first they decided to stay neutral, but then as the war started, the Tennessee, the middle part of Tennessee, which was sort of on the fence, the neutral part, they decided their mind was changed. And so the legislature, the governing body of the state of Tennessee, voted one day to secede and join the Confederacy. Now, it wasn't a major player in the Civil War, but it was a major place, a lot of battles there. But here's what I want you not to miss, right? Because on the day after Tennessee voted to secede from the Union, 
East Tennessee voted to secede from Tennessee. So, and it's a little known fact in history. So what happened is the East Tennessee actually said, nope, the legitimate government is the United States. We're loyal to the union. So when Tennessee joined the rebellion, East Tennessee said, we're not part of the rebellion. We're actually the rebellion against the rebellion. Now, why does this matter for us? Well, first of all, it didn't go well for East Tennessee. The, the, uh, there was a, a many, many battles fought. They were suppressed and more. But the reality is we live in a world, remember again, from a stone in heaven, God rules over all. Our world is in an illegal and illegitimate rebellion against the rightful reign of a good, holy, sovereign, and perfect God. We ourselves are the rebellion against the rebellion. We have been taken from that, made citizens of another kingdom. Our loyalty is to King Jesus. So we, at all of our Saddleback campuses, if you follow Jesus, you are citizens of East Tennessee. <laughs> this will be an appropriate time for you to say, yee haw. Very well done. But I don't want you to miss this because we're the rebellion against the rebellion. And in doing so, we bear a hope to a world in rebellion that there's a better way. And just as the secession of the southern states in the U.S. was illegal and illegitimate, that really it never happened legally, the same it is with our world. The reality is the world doesn't know that Jesus is Lord. But one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess what's been true all along, that he is Lord. So hope is found in two advents and one kingdom. Now I told you at the beginning I wasn't going to leave off the first part. Let's look at number four and finally. You know what it means when a guest speaker says, and finally? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Just get ready for that. Number four is the hope of Christ. The hope of Christ. Now why? Because of two words at the beginning, right? Right here at the beginning. Repent for the kingdom. Repent because. And you say, Ed, how does the hope of Christ have to do with repentance? Listen, if you sing Christmas carols, you're going to be singing more about repentance in the next few weeks than probably any other time in the year. See, repentance is how we respond to what God has done in Christ if you're here, any of our campuses, or you're watching online and you're not a follower of Jesus, the answer to the problems of the sin of the world ultimately boils down to how will you respond? Now it has implications around the world, but how will you respond? And Jesus invites you to repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repentance is simply to turn around, take a, another direction. To say, I'm going this way, but now I'm going this way. It literally means to change your mind about something. And here's what I want to invite you to change your mind about. Because ultimately, if this is true, that there's a first advent and soon coming a second advent, and in the first advent, the King of kings and the Lord of lords has come. God the Son was born, Jesus the Christ, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for your sins and in your place, and on God raised him from the dead on the third day. That news changes everything. I don't know about you. But if there was a guy who was dead on Friday and on Sunday, not so much, I'm going with that guy. <laughs> I want to invite you to trust and follow Jesus in repentance, to receive the hope of Christ. But you know, that's also the hope of Christ that I have. I still today, as a follower of Jesus, find myself, maybe you're holier and godlier than me. Very distinct possibility. But I find myself drawn to the world's rebellion at times. Sometimes I see the world going this direction against the rule of a sovereign and perfect God and my heart sometimes feels drawn that direction. So what do I do? I repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want to invite you to do that very thing. See, there's not a person here who can't hear that message and come back to Romans. This is the verse we started with. It's Romans chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. It says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up. So this happened. The root of Jesse sprung up. That's a picture of Jesus. He's a descendant of Jesse. One who will arise and rule over the nations. That's still to come. So the root of Jesse sprung up and I'm a citizen of the kingdom by his grace and through faith. So I'm a citizen of the kingdom. So the root of Jesse sprung up. One will arise to rule the nations. So between the first advent and the second advent, I work for his kingdom purposes. Because in him, 
the Gentiles will hope. That's me. May the God of hope fill you, Paul writes. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I can't tell you it's always easy between the first and the second advent. Man, I've been through hard times. You've been hard times. I've lost loved ones. I've seen brokenness, injustice. I see people who don't know Jesus. I see people die without Christ. And yet at the same time, I see people changed by the power of the gospel. I see miracles take place. I see the inbreaking of the kingdom of God changing lives and changing circumstances. And I just want to say to you, as we look to Advent, spoiler alert, Jesus is going to be born. But he has been born. And now this can happen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Sisters and brothers, hope is found in two Advents in one kingdom, as citizens of the kingdom, we follow him in the midst of a broken and hurting world. If you're not a follower of Jesus, in just a moment, I'm actually gonna give you the opportunity to respond and trust him as your Lord and Savior. If you are a follower of Jesus, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond and remind again that as in this Advent season, we know King Jesus has come and he's brought us hope. Would you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge today that by your grace and your goodness, you have redeemed us and called us by name. We acknowledge today that if we're followers of Jesus, we have been changed by the power of that gospel. So as Christians are praying and acknowledging this Advent beginning, replaying the story we know, may our hope be found assured and confident in you. As maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you're thinking between these times, you're thinking, Ed, you don't know, it's been a hard time. I gotta tell you, it was a hard time any time we're between the first and the second coming. When the war's won but not done, that's a hard year. When Jesus has said it is finished but tells us to pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done, can I tell you, hold on to the hope that you have found in Christ. So if you're a follower of Jesus, just take this moment and you pray and say, Lord Jesus, help me to hold to that hope. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, can I, can I just invite you, using the words of Jesus, to repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want to invite you to turn from your ways and trust Jesus. And if that's the prayer of your heart right now, just using your own words or these words, just pray this silently to the Lord. Just pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, just silently to the Lord if it's a prayer of your heart. Forgive me of my sin. Lord Jesus, I turn from my ways and I follow your ways. I receive the new life you have given me. I trust and follow you, King Jesus. As a citizen of your kingdom, I walk in the hope you have provided. Just as others around you are praying, if you've just prayed that prayer with me, no matter where you are, what campus you are, if you're watching online, you can actually take this card that's available on our campuses or interact with us online. And my response to today's message, the first thing could be, I made a decision to follow Jesus today. Listen, uh, we, people at all of our campuses are praying for you right now if you're trusting and following him, if you're considering it to take that next step.